I'd like to welcome you all to lecture, but also to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Sarah Azaransky. Dr. Azaransky is author of its worldwide struggle, religion, and the international roots of the civil rights movement, an Oxford Press book published in 2017, which identifies a network of black Christian intellectuals and activists who looked abroad, including in other religious traditions, for ideas and practices that could transform American democracy. From 1930s to the 1950s, they drew lessons from independence movements around the world for an American racial justice campaign. The book reveals fertile intersections of worldwide resistance movements, American racial politics, and interreligious exchanges that cross literal borders and disciplinary boundaries. Dr. Azaransky's other publications include The Dream is Freedom, Pauli Murray, and American Democratic Faith, also an Oxford Press book. How impressive, too. Um, I'm just messing with you. Um, and an edited volume, Religion and Politics in America's Borderlands. She is co author of a successful application for Pauli Murray's childhood home in Durham, North Carolina, to be named a National Historic Landmark. She is currently working on a book about mid century campaigns to desegregate New York City public schools as well as on a spiritual autobiography of Bayard Rustin. Dr. Azaransky earned her BA with high honors from Swarthmore College with a major in religion in 1998. Um, uh, as, a, as a Watson fellow, she uh, conducted research on cross-community women's peace organizing in Northern Ireland, Israel, and the West Bank and Sri Lanka. She received her Master's of Theological Studies from Harvard and her PhD from the University of Virginia. Before joining the Union Theological Seminary faculty, she taught in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. Now please give her a Duke Divinity School welcome, Dr. Edgarinas. Wonderful, hello everyone. Thank you all for the lovely introduction. I'm really grateful to be with you for the Polly Murray and Nanny Helen Burroughs lecture series sponsored by the Office of Black Church Studies. So thank you to the Office of Black Church Studies. This lecture series asks us to notice critical intersections of race, gender, and class as they relate to transformative uplift in church and society. Certainly Burroughs and Murray's work, their writing, their teaching, their activism underscores these critical intersections. I've written and taught about Polly Murray. She is my focus today. I'm gonna to talk for about 30 minutes and then I hope we can talk together. We can think about, to start with, I think we can think about Murray the way that black feminist sociologist, Patricia Hill Collins has described Sojourner Truth. Quote, she was a visionary in her ideals concerning equity and justice yet pragmatic about the political actions needed to make justice a reality. The richness of her biography signals a significance far greater than her individual life. Richness of biography certainly describes Murray. Murray was poet, lawyer, professor, priest, activist, chain smoking firebrand. Murray told Eleanor Roosevelt people could not wait Murray told Bayard Rustin he ought to know better, and Murray pushed Ruth Bader Ginsburg to transformative jurisprudence. Murray identified as a woman. Murray identified as a man. Murray described a younger self in terms of a little boy-girl personality. Murray did not have access to what today are pretty standard and nevertheless life-affirming questions. What pronouns do you use? didn't have access to contemporary understandings of trans and non-binary experiences and practices. Yet Murray nevertheless experimented with identifying differently at different times of life. In this talk, I'm going to follow the work of Rosalind Rosenberg, S. Ellen Fisher, and Brittany Cooper, all of whom have done a lot to think through how Murray most often identifies. All three use she, her pronouns to refer to Murray, and by and large, I will also. But occasionally, I'll use they, them to remind us there's something else. 
that Murray's gender performance and at times gender identity exceed she, her pronouns. The title of this talk, All the Tangled Roots, comes from Proud Shoes, Murray's family memoir. Proud Shoes is about Durham also, of course, because Murray belonged to this place. Born in Baltimore, Murray moved here after Murray's mother's sudden death when Murray was three and was raised by her maternal aunts. Murray's childhood home, which we've referenced, and I don't know my directions and there aren't windows, um, was at 906 Carroll Street, which is just about two miles from here, and was recently named a National Historic Landmark and will soon, or is currently, but will soon be open um, as the Polly Murray Center for, Historic, for History, pardon me, and Social Justice. And you, you all who live in Durham have probably seen Murray's face that is on, it, there are a handful of murals around town with different versions of her face over the years on buildings throughout the city. So Murray quite literally looks over you here in Durham. In our time together today, I'm gonna look at a particular moment in this particular person's biography. In doing so, I believe that we can add to our cache of theological and moral resources. I'm a social ethicist. Oh, and that's the mic, sorry. Um, and my work analyzes historical sources of moral knowledge and aims to expand our moral traditions to include heretofore overlooked visionaries and practitioners. According to Christian ethicist Tracy West, when we pay attention, quote, to the multiple actors and innovators in the moral dramas of history, we can see how important moral knowledge is generated. In her work, to identify the cultural production of evil, Emily Towns emphasizes the moral significance of counter memories and counter histories. According to Towns, it is crucial, quote, to recognize from the outset that the story can be told in another way. It can be told in a way that the voices and those whose lives have traditionally and historically been left out are now heard with clarity and precision. Even more, Towns continues, these voices can then be included into the discourse, not as additive or appendage, but as resources and co-determiners of actions and strategies, end quote. Attending to Murray, as this lecture series does, so hooray for you, allows us to think with Murray as integral to our work in a divinity school as a co-determiner of actions and strategies. Implicit in Townsend's call of telling the story in the other way is listening. Voices like Murray's may be, again, as Towns said, heard with clarity and precision. For my part, as a white professor who researches and teaches, my work is to listen to many others who know more than I do so that I may undertake work that is more just that is accountable to my students and to my colleagues. Today, I'm gonna to concentrate on one episode in Murray's biography that helps us to see some of the tangled roots of theological reflection and moral action. This episode is, again, to use Towns' terminology, a counter memory. What Towns says, quote, begins with the particular to move into the universal, and it looks to the past for micro history to force a reconsideration of flawed, be it incomplete or vastly circumscribed histories. Towns continues, this focus on localized experiences of oppression in counter memory allows us to refocus dominant narratives into a reframing of what constitutes the universe. So tomorrow you are screening this documentary about Murray called My Name is Polly Murray. Maybe some of you have already seen it. It's on Amazon Prime. So if you can't make it tomorrow and you have access to Prime or someone's password, you can see it that way. Um, it is a lovely and effective account of Murray. Uh, you, you hear Murray's voice. You see photographs from throughout Murray's life, including her youth, great pictures of Murray camping. It's great. Um, and the documentary, one of the episodes that the documentary talks about is Murray's arrest on a bus in 1940. And the account the documentary gives is true. And I'm gonna give you another account that's also true. And that emphasizes an aspect of Murray's life and work that can be missed 
by people who aren't trained at a divinity school. So to talk about the bus episode, the bus arrest. On Easter weekend in 1940, Polly Murray was arrested in Petersburg, Virginia for sitting in the front section of a bus. Murray remembered saying to the driver, you haven't learned a thing in 2000 years. I could not forget that it was Easter even, she said. She later wrote to a friend, we did not plan our arrest intentionally. The situation developed, she wrote, and having developed, we applied what we knew of Satyagraha on the spot, including by petitioning the warden for courteous treatment, explaining what they were doing and why, and by talking with fellow prisoners about their strategy. In this moment, we have historical, critical, liberative, and anti-colonial readings of the gospel. We have theological analysis of existing power relations and critical engagement with activism and theory from other parts of the world, indeed from other religious traditions, that is also applied and worked out in the US context. Murray had studied Gandhian nonviolence and looked for opportunities to apply it in the United States. When Murray admonished the bus driver that he hadn't learned a thing in 2000 years, they compared Jim Crow to Roman occupation. The bus driver who enforced segregation law was akin in Murray's mind to Roman imperial authorities who had arrested and executed Jesus. 20th century Jim Crow was morally analogous to Roman occupation of Palestine two millennia ago. As a Christian pacifist, Murray took heart in Jesus's example that resistance to occupation was what God required. Murray made a Christian claim, but she also characterized her response in terms of satyagraha, a term that, kept, that Gandhi had developed to describe his nonviolent campaigns in both South Africa and in, later in India. A combination of the Sanskrit term satya, meaning truth, and agraha, meaning insistence, the term has variously been translated as truth force or soul force. The term satyagraha was anchored in an Indian religious context in both Hinduism and Jainism in different ways and tied to nonviolent efforts in South Africa and in India. When Murray used it to respond to their arrest, she also juxtaposed it to Christianity and put it in an American context. The arrest was an opportunity for her to work out how to employ these traditions in complementary ways to confront Jim Crow. Now, to understand how Murray was able to apply what she knew of Satyagraha on the spot, we need to situate Murray in the midst of an international turn in Black political thought that happened after the 1920s. Black internationalism emerged, particularly the interwar variety, emerged from comparisons between racism in the United States and racism and imperial oppression in other parts of the world. Now, this category and this term, Black internationalism, describes something really wide and deep, and even wider and deeper than what I'm just about to say, which is we can look from Martin Delaney and Alexander Crimmel in the 1800s to Stokely Carmichael, who would become um, Kwame Torre and Malcolm X and Asada Shakur, who still lives in exile in Cuba. So this is a broad category. Um, and the period between World War I and World War II is a high point of Black internationalism. And historians often cite W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey as paradigmatic Black internationalists. So Jamaican Marcus Garvey moved the headquarters of his UNIA from Kingston to Harlem and established over 1,900 1,900 UNIA chapters in over 40 countries and colonies, truly international movement. Du Bois led a series of Pan-African conferences that stoked an international conversation of politics and strategy among Black people throughout the diaspora, many of whom would become leaders of anti-colonial movements in the Caribbean and Africa. Too often we neglect how Du Bois gave geographic specificity to the dilemma of the last century. You all know part of the quotation that I'm about to say. You know, In 1903, Du Bois wrote, the problem of the 20th century is, is the problem of the color line. That's not the end of the sentence. There's a dash. Du Bois continues, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa and America and the islands of the sea. 
So for Du Bois, the problem of the 20th century was always a problem within a larger international context. Du Bois and Garvey are often pitted as rivals, and indeed they disagreed about a lot, but they shared a conviction that Black Americans are part of a global movement against white supremacy. The Black press was instrumental in fostering this internationalist perspective, exemplified by decades-long interest um, in the Indian independence movement. So Mohandas Gandhi's campaign between, became, pardon me, a cause celeb for Black Americans. Beginning in earnest with Gandhi's non-cooperation campaign in 1921, Black newspapers weighed in on the significance of Gandhi's method and political vision for Black resistance to white racism. The Black press emphasized Gandhi as an important example of a person of color leading a freedom struggle against an entrenched racist colonial power. Gandhi's blending of religious and political ideas caught the attention of Black American Christians who looked for ways to experiment with Gandhi-inspired activism in the U.S. context. Now, drawing lessons from international anti-colonial activists, a group of Black Christian activists in the 1940s experimented with Gandhian nonviolent direct action. So Polly Murray, as we've seen, along with Bayard Rustin and James Farmer, among many others, are examples of these sorts of activists. They applied international and interreligious resources in the American context through individual and through group protests. This activism marked a turning point in the Black freedom movement as they grounded their protests in a Black religious pacifism. While working in part with majority white organizations like the Fellowship of Reconciliation, who some of you may have heard of or know about historically, and founding interracial organizations like the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE, Murray Farmer and Rustin nevertheless developed what Farmer called the race logic of pacifism. The race logic of pacifism. The idea that pacifism in the US for it to be pacifism needed to confront the greatest or among the greatest sources of violence, anti-Black racism. These three Black activists devised a religious pacifism that was also distinctly Black. Their early activism illuminates, furthermore, questions about the role of gender and sexuality in the Black freedom movement, as we'll also see in a second. So going back to her Petersburg arrest, we see in her Petersburg arrest that Polly Murray juxtaposed Gandhian tactics and the Christian story. Murray made an astute theological comparison between Jim Crow and the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. Since the Gospels depicted how Jesus opposed imperial rule in the ancient world, Murray wagered that God opposed white supremacist practices in the U.S. On Easter weekend, which memorializes the climax of the Christian story, Murray situated herself and others who resisted Jim Crow as sharing solidarity with Jesus. To give direction and moral force to her resistance, Murray employed what she knew of Satyagraha. On its face, Murray used the steps of Gandhian nonviolence in this particular situation in a utilitarian fashion. That is, using Satyagraha when the opportunity arose and it suited her. Yet on closer inspection, her use of Satyagraha has implications for Christian witness. It provided the method and means to resist Jim Crow in light of how she connected American racism with Jesus's experience of Imperial Rome. Such a graha was part of what enabled her to reflect gospel realities. To enact a Christian practice of resisting unjust authority, Murray's arrest shows how multiple moral traditions can inspire action. The method of such a graha helped Murray to act as she believed a Christian should. In other words, Satyagraha in this case enabled Christian practice. Murray was arrested and jailed and hoped the NAACP would take the case to challenge segregation in interstate travel. The NAACP didn't in this case, and it would be six years until the precedent setting case in Morgan v. Virginia, which I'll talk about in just a second, where the Supreme Court found that segregation in interstate travel was indeed unconstitutional. Murray's later autobiographical account of the arrest minimizes a significant aspect of it. The context of Murray's visit to Durham, 
So we who applied Satyagraha on the spot, we knew what we applied, what we, we applied, pardon me, what we knew of Satyagraha on the spot, she later wrote to a friend, that we included Adeline McBean, who was Murray's roommate, and if not at that point, had most likely previously been Murray's romantic partner, who Murray was bringing home to meet Murray's family. Murray did not identify publicly as someone who loved other women, and the categories of trans and non-binary non were not available to Murray. Yet we know something of Murray's sexual and gender identities and practices because Murray saved journals, medical records, and memos to doctors from the era. And the documentary will do a lovely job of talking about this and quoting from these letters back and forth um, to doctors. Their archives show that in the 1930s, Murray was absorbed by emerging scholarship about sexuality and gender and hoped it would provide categories to describe Murray's own experiences as a male identified person who loved women. Historian Glenda Gilmore has discovered a fascinating subtext to the Petersburg episode. In May 1940, two months after Murray's arrest, the Urban League's Opportunity Magazine published a story, a report, about a young black couple who was arrested while integrating a bus. The story drew from an eyewitness account of a white passenger who had been traveling from Washington uh, to Durham uh, in late March and described the pair as a young woman and quote, a young man of slight build and sensitive in voice and manner. The story reported that the young man presented himself as Oliver Fleming. In all likelihood, the couple was Murray and McBean. The eyewitness recognized Murray as Murray had wished to be understood in that moment as male. Murray's choice to dress as a man for the trip meant the bus protest was likely not planned. As Gilmore points out, Murray would have been aware of the risks of being arrested under the Mann Act, a law which was ostensibly about human trafficking, but was used instead to target people who did not adhere to racist and patriarchal sexual mores. Now, Murray's autobiographical account, so she talks about the bus arrest, she talks about being in jail in her autobiography, um, describes their placement in the women's cell. So if Murray had been dressed as a man, Murray either identified as a woman or the police quickly categorized Murray as such. What's interesting about her autobiographical account of the bus arrest, again, also true, multiple different true versions of, of a similar episode. Um, Murray's later retelling of her time in jail is notably gendered, this time informed by a sense of respectability. Murray described how they were scandalized by the language of their cellmates, some of whom Murray identified as sex workers, and by language of men in the neighboring cells. Nevertheless, McBean and Murray, as Murray reports, were able to educate fellow prisoners about why they had been arrested and describe the method of Satyagraha they attempted with the jailers. Murray's, Murray's autobiographical account of her arrest and time in prison as Brittany Cooper has pointed out, subsumed gender performance to the narrative of racial segregation. Cooper has argued that both the refusal of the NAA to take Murray's case and Murray's own later characterization in her autobiography of Murray's time in jail, quote, this is Cooper, underscores the broad reach of respectability politics. The ways in which respectability politics has played a role in constructing black gender performances of manhood and womanhood, and the extent to which the regime, regime of respectability circumscribed and limited the strategies of political resistance available to those in the broader African American freedom struggle. End quote. Now, even though the NAA didn't take Murray's case in 1940, Murray remained committed to innovating new kinds of activism. So, in the wake of her arrest for a time, this arrest for a time. She lived at the Harlem Ashram, an interracial, interreligious commune at 124th and 5th Avenue, which was active from 1940 to 1947. The Harlem Ashram was modeled after ashrams or Hindu religious centers that Gandhi had established in India and South Africa. Other Harlem Ashram residents included Ruth Reynolds, a white pacifist who would become a leader in Puerto Rico's independence movement, as well as James Farmer, a founder of CORE. Byard Rustin lived nearby and visited often. He lived on 109th Street and would often go back and forth. So 
for those of you who know the geography a little bit, I drove past the Harlem Ashram on my way to the airport. So it's like always in my mind or where it was. Um, the Ashram folded in 1947 and it's easy to read it as a historical footnote. But, but the short-lived experiment provided an important training ground for activists. From the Ashram, activists organized sit-ins, multi-city marches, and a major bus campaign from 1940 to 1947, all of which would become mainstays of a later movement. The Ashram shows us that what Rustin would call the classical phase of the civil rights movement had its roots in earlier decades of intellectual and practical work. In fact, in the last months of the Ashram, a group of activists planned the journey of reconciliation a multi-state bus campaign to test Morgan v. Virginia, the Supreme Court precedent. So Murray and McBean's arrest had come six years before Irene's successful, Irene Morgan, pardon me, successful appeal of her arrest for not ceding her seat to a white passenger. In 1946, the Supreme Court ruled in Morgan v. Virginia that segregation in interstate transportation was indeed unconstitutional. Activists connected with the ashram saw um, seized on Morgan as an opportunity to take action. They devised a kind of traveling test of the decision that would be an opportunity to educate local communities about the case along the way. For two weeks in April, 1947, an interracial team of 16, of 16 men, eight black men and eight white men, traveled on buses through Virginia, North Carolina. Bayard Rustin was actually arrested right near here uh, outside UNC. Um, Tennessee and Kentucky. Women activists wanted to be part of the rides. Polly Murray, Juanita Nelson, who at the time also lived at the ashram, and Ella Baker, Ella Baker, who needs no explanation, <laughs> were, who lived in Harlem at the time and was an NAA organizer at that time, were all part of the planning team and wanted women to be among the protesters. Majority of the planners, however, were male, and they felt that having interracial teams of men and women would complicate the protest. There are sharp ironies in this, of course, among them that case setting precedent was a result of Irene Morgan's appeal of her arrest and that Murray had already been arrested on a bus when she navigated multiple registers of what we might call gender trouble. The journey of reconciliation took place in April, 1947. So I try not to do too much dates with you, but this is important, April, 1947. A few months later, in July 1947, July 1947, a piece was published that Murray would have written earlier because it takes time for pieces to be published. <laughs> um, an article called uh, In Negro Digest, which is a precursor to um, Essence magazine, Why Negro Girls Stay Single, wherein she named as Jane Crow, Black women's experiences of being discriminated against as a result of racism and sexism. Murray distinguished Jane Crow from white women's and black men's concerns. Murray wrote, quote, for within this framework of male supremacy, as well as white supremacy, the Negro woman finds herself at the bottom of the economic and social scale, end quote. Murray wrote this article in the immediate aftermath of not being allowed to participate in an activist experiment that she felt had great potential. Indeed, by all accounts, the journey of reconciliation would be an important precursor to the 1961 Freedom Rides. Now, Murray's concept of Jane Crow is, of course, part of a long and diverse tradition of Black women theorizing about the intersection of multiple identities, including Sojourner Truth, Anna Julia Cooper, Claudia Jones, Johnny Tillman, Alicia Garza, among many others. Murray was not then the first or the last to theorize about what she called Jane Crow, yet her category made particular and strategic interventions in American history. In fact, practical interventions that shape all of our lives here if we live and work in this country or will ever work in this country. Long story short, we'll talk more about this and the details of it. In 1964, Murray employed the category of Jane Crow to keep sex as a category in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Law, which makes it unlawful to discriminate against someone in employment on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, or sex. Some lawmakers saw the category of sex as a distraction 
in a law that was supposed to focus on discrimination on the basis of race. As a black woman, Murray argued that both sex and race needed to be included if the law was to protect her. Including sex was crucial to racial justice. Murray laid the groundwork for the legal analysis that Kimberly Crenshaw would publish in 1989 when Crenshaw undertook critical analysis of how the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, whose job it is to make sure Title VII is enforced, that the EEOC was not recognizing how discrimination on the basis of race and sex intersected in Black women's lives in particular ways. So intersectionality emerges in part out of Crenshaw's legal theorizing about Title VII, for which Murray had worked diligently to include sex. In June 2020, so we're in the pandemic still, not really, I don't know. So like yesterday, I don't know where that means, recently. Sex was part of a title, sex as part of Title VII, pardon me, in June 2020. Sex was part, as part of Title VII was integral to a landmark Supreme Court ruling in Bostock v. Clayton County that prohibits employers from firing people because they are gay or trans. Neil Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion. Neil Gorsuch wrote the majority opinion. And Gorsuch cited the category of sex in Title VII when he wrote, quote, it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual on the basis of sex, end quote. Murray's theorizing about Jane Crow, Murray's insistence that sex be included in Title VII led also to a landmark ruling supporting the rights of gay and trans workers today for all of us. It is not a coincidence, I don't think, that Murray's moral reasoning, her sense of multiple registers of identity and expression, of being and practice, would lead to a landmark ruling that recognizes the rights and the humanity of gay and trans people. I actually think it makes great theological sense. So Murray, you might know this about Murray. Murray was the first black woman to be officially ordained as an Episcopal priest in 1977. But we've already seen how Murray was thinking and acting theologically decades before when she told the driver he hadn't learned a thing in 2000 years. So Murray was studying and practicing activism with other black Christians who were underscoring how Christianity is an anti-colonial faith that demands action against anti-black racism. Murray was a lifelong Episcopalian. So at the time she's living in New York, um, during her Harlem years, she attends St. Phillips, which is an Episcopal church at, I'm pointing uptown, sorry, at 131st and 7th Avenue. So recall that Murray wrote about Jane Crow in the months after she and other black women were not permitted to participate in the journey of reconciliation. So part of what sparks this analysis is that experience. The journey of reconciliation, which was led, yes, by Bayard Rustin and George Hauser and a brigade of other black and white men who anchored their activism in their Christian commitments. So if we explore Murray's activism of the period as a counter memory, then this and how this slight by a group of activists led Murray to develop what would become the expansive category of Jane Crow, we see how faith and practice may combine in radical ways. Now, I'll leave you with what I wonder, and that is that those of us who are at divinity schools, and I'll speak from a seminary perspective, that we know something in the ways that Murray knew, and that we can receive this counter memory also as a kind of revelation. So a few years ago, I read something um, about how the Anglican church, the church in England was marking the bicentenary for the act of the abolition of the slave trade. This was in 2007. And I read about how Rose Hudson Vulcan, who was then a vicar and who is now the Bishop of Dover, the first black woman to be installed as a bishop in the Church of England, that she said, for British people to begin to reckon with their role in enslavement, they ought to center the body of Christ, which exists not only at one time, but exists across history. So we are connected to many others in the past, Hudson Wilkin argued, because the body of Christ is transtemporal. That, or I submit, pardon me, that we can interpret Murray's Jane Crow 
good Episcopalian that she was, as an articulation of the body of Christ, which exists not only at one time, but exists across history, to bodies in the past and to bodies in the future. With Jane Crow, Murray connected Murray's self to bodies in the future in all of their diversity and integrity. With Jane Crow, Murray enabled a connection to what she knew about people because she knew it about herself. Even if Murray didn't have available the categories we do now, such as non-binary and trans, Murray pointed us toward a capacious understanding of human being that underscores the diversity within the body of Christ. What she knew means that none other than Neil Gorsuch inherited her work through Title VII to affirm the rights and humanity of trans and queer people. So there are many ways to tell the story of Polly Murray, and it is indeed good news that we can continue to tell the story in another way. And when we do so, I believe we begin to see and to do the important work of broadening our sources of moral knowledge. Thanks so much. This is a quick question. <laughs> um, I go to an interracial church, as I've told you, and we've had a Polly Murray reading group there for years. Um, we, we sort of run out of stuff to read, though. So I would love for us to read your book. Aren't you working on a book now? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I mean, yeah. So it's yes. So my <laughs> quick answer. Um, so my, my first book was about Polly Murray. That was my dissertation. And then the, the, the subsequent book sort of emerges about Murray, um, emerges from Murray, but ends up talking about this collection that I recognize. I recognize that she was part of this larger framework that I wasn't talking about as much as was mentioned. And when I went to, to start the second book, there was this moment when she was at Howard Law School, actually. And she uh, reached out to Howard Thurman. So if you all have read Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited, you might recognize this. So she was not alone in making this comparison between Jim Crow and colonialism and making this anti-colonial argument. Um, and she actually reached out to Thurman for advice. And Thurman didn't give her an answer that she appreciated, but that in order to like write the three paragraphs in that book about Howard and what was happening at Howard, I went back and discovered Thurman and um, Benjamin Mays, who had already left Morehouse, but that they were great friends. And I thought I would write, everyone always talked about how great friends they were, and no one was sort of writing about that. So I thought, well, maybe I could write like a theological buddy book about the two of them. And I started on that road and then found that there was this larger collection of folks. So the second book really talks about Murray and Rustin. Rustin ends up being on the cover because problems, but I fell in love. Um, he's really charismatic and compelling and end up talking about Murray as well and really understanding that a lot of what we, and, and there are much better, longer historiographies of thinking about the long freedom movement, but really recognizing a lot of this religious work and the work to um, what was the connection, for example, between Gandhi and King. It was these folks who met, went to meet with Gandhi, Black women and Black men. Um, and came back and, and we're doing this work. And so Murray doesn't go to India, but we see her as part of this collection of folks who are doing this study. So you're going to suggest that book for me? Sure, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I'll send so you much. a copy. It'll, oh, whoa, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is really significant because, I mean, there's an, uh, let me be honest about the church I've gone to for years. Um, you know, you think you're a white person and you're going to be so welcoming of others and stuff but then you know you become the minority and you realize that you know you got some real biases that you thought you didn't have and um 
you know, it's easy to go be in an all white church and just think, you know, this, I'm, I'm a welcoming person. Everybody is a child of God. But to actually be in a situation where you have to understand one another's lives and lives that are very different, this is really helpful. In other words, you can say, well, we ought to do that. But to have a book that you read that sort of goes through some of these realities, I mean, that's been our history, is that when we read something, a, a book like we've read some Pauline Murray stuff, um, it really helps trigger honest conversations. And um, we can't just, as you know, as a white person, I can't just act like, oh, well, I'm, I'm a nice person. You know, here I am and blah, blah, blah. So the book will just be really helpful. Thank you so much. You're doing terrific stuff. <laughs>it's hard to come after Dr. Fulkerson. Um, but um, I just wanted to ask you, um, can you speak a little bit about uh, the call story of, of Polly Murray? Um, it, we had read Argyle event of Von Grumbach and she had a very interesting uh, call story in reference to her being comfortable with spreading the word of God, uh, being a woman, uh, like the whole, you know, the scriptures on this topic. Uh, and so can you speak a little bit about Polly Murray kind of being comfortable with uh, being a, uh, a a prophet? Yeah, so her call, the call story in terms of her being called to seminary or in terms of, is that what you mean? You can take it that way. <laughs> That's fine. Well, no, but it's- yeah, yeah. Like to stay, yeah yes, uh, to ministry. Yes, ma'am. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, sure. I mean, so one of the things to that to talk about Murray's biography, so you know, we're talking um, at the time she is that she decides to go to seminary. She's a woman in her 60s and she's teaching at Brandeis. And the documentary is going to do actually that that is being filmed tomorrow. My name is Polly Murray, also on Amazon. I don't get any money for saying that. Um, um is talks will will do a really lovely job of talking about this moment in her life. And so she's at Brandeis, she's hired at Brandeis. Um, both because she's incredibly talented and cynically because uh, PWIs, predominantly white institutions at the time, are wanting to hire black faculty. And so she's, she's hired for many reasons. That is, as the documentary presents, it might be one of the reasons. And she's hired at a time that all across the campus, there's a black student movement to be taking over different parts of different schools and make demands, um, a number of demands, including demands about um, uh, curriculum and changes in the university. And arguably of all the student movements around universities in the United States in the 1960s, this is the one that has had the biggest, greatest lasting effect. And that we see effects of it still in terms of black studies at different schools. So, so the, one of the beginnings of black studies is really in this student movement of the late 60s. By all accounts, she and the documentary will talk about this on the, on the one hand, she shares so much about how the activists were speaking and what they were asking for, and she didn't, wasn't quite able to see it. So part of what motivates, in part, her call to seminary is I think she always had a call. As we see, she's always thinking and acting theologically. She's always doing this really great theological reflection. But something else happens during this time, and that is, by all accounts, who was her romantic partner, which will also be described in the documentary, dies. And she... Yeah, yeah, so you have to see the documentary. Um, and, it, and it gives a really sort of touching account of their relationship and how important this relationship was to her. And then even Murray's autobiography, she talks about when she died, she was called to minister to her, but didn't have, was not officially a priest. And so she had always felt called, but at that time, the Episcopal Church was not yet ordaining women. And it wasn't clear that the Episcopal Church was gonna make that decision. Nevertheless, she left her job. She was tenured at Brandeis. For any of you who know and understand what it means to leave tenure. Ooh. She had her whole career had never, and she was not alone in this, um, had never really had professional and financial stability. So for her to leave this position and go to seminary, you guys know something about that. <laughs> so she goes to General in New York. And um, I, almost as soon as she graduates, women are then officially ordained. And she is the first black woman to be officially ordained. So I'm saying officially because 
talking about the Philadelphia 11, which you might, might know a little bit about the history of the Episcopal Church. So she in part really traces her call to something that she always knew. She describes these problems of human rights, as she says, or, or the problems I've always been working on and the law was no longer enough, that she needed to have sort of a different, I don't want to say deeper, but I'm at a divinity school, so I'll say it. Sometimes I talk to law schools and I have to explain to them that religion's okay. Um, <laughs> Um, but that I think that this really this deeper register of really talking about and understanding human beings and the work of the spirit in the world. Um, and that's where, you know, when I think about her category of Jane Crow, it's profoundly a legal category. My goodness, there's so many. Oh, Gorsuch is using your work to forward justice for trans and gay people. There's something going on. But that, I hope that answers. Sure, if I should have my mask on or not. Uh, <laughs> rules are changing. Um, well, thank you, Juan. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of along the lines of that same question. Um, Polly writes to uh, the Bishop of Massachusetts uh, requesting postulancy, and she writes this 10 bullet points letter. And the last one, I'm, I'm, if you don't mind, I'll read a little of it. Please, please. Thank you. He writes, why finally was I blessed by Bishop Henry Delaney on his dying bed in 1927 when I was about 17? And the last time I saw him, he called me a child of destiny. What did he mean? The hardest thing for me in life has been to say with full honesty, thy will, not mine, be done, O Lord. How do you tie in Polly's specific prophetic vocation to her understanding of, of Jane Crow, of intersec inter, um, intersectionality? Yes, but also um, a diversity within the body of Christ is really what I'm trying to get at. Um. I'm going to do what Emily Town says and start with a particular and get particular. Um, and that is to talk about um, a, a Doreen Drury, who's a historian who wrote a dissertation about Murray and was one of the first people to really write critically and just amazingly well about uh, Murray's um, gender identity and performance. And I want to use both those categories because I think they're both at play at different moments. Um, and one of the things that Drury writes about is that not only did Murray exceed the categories during her time that she lived, but it's almost as though she exceeds the categories that we have now, that there was ways in which she knew about human beings that like she, she left like little Easter eggs almost that we're only now like figuring out like, oh, that's what is going on, that it's more than, not that intersectionality isn't enough, but there's some, some more registers of humanity. And I think that's in part what that prophetic call was recognizing, with that she was marked from an early age as understanding and being in the world and being in a body, but being in a body that she had to do that critical work to understand. So yes, it's her experience. Yes, it's her identity and her performance, but it's that constant critical reflection of figuring out what does that mean, which is not easy work to do. So I think part of what she offers us, so back to the question of call and, and, and to your question, is that I think the theological language that we have access to, this notion of you know, body of, of body of Christ and diversity that exists in diversity, um, Audre Lorde talks about non-dominant differences. What does that mean? We don't even, we can't imagine what that means. Or I don't, we can maybe imagine, but very few of us have experiences of non-dominant differences. I think Polly Murray was living that in Polly's body. And part of that prophetic witness is that she particularly was traditioned in such a way to be pushing the edges of her tradition to realize where in the tradition it talked about that and lived that out, which isn't to say that she didn't make mistakes and isn't to say that she always understood, but 
I think that she ends up being this rich resource to help us to think and act theologically and morally because her, like, that people saw in her this sort of capacious understanding. Thank you. Oh, wow, this is like perfect height for me. <laughs> Meant to Not be. to brag. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask if you could speak a little more about um, Maury's inner religious background, um, specifically how it maybe informed and shaped their gender presentation and identity. Um, oh, if there's anything to say about that. Great question. I don't know that there is, <laughs> but I like, really like the question. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things I'll say about, because that's a category I use. So I come from Union. I mean, I don't come from Union. I teach at Union. I live there. We all live there. So in that sense, I do come from Union. Um, and one of the things that we like to think characterizes us as a seminary and might in 10 years, we're still working on it, is that we're a seminary that takes that practices and, and tries to take seriously interreligious engagement. So we're historically and remain a majority Christian seminary, but what it means to really think about Christianity as necessarily always in conversation with different traditions and what it means to really recognize. And when we think about all of the ways in which power operates in a seminary, one of those ways is through tradition and in a Christian seminary through Christianity, period. So that's to say that's my background. So when I use interreligious, I'm in part like keying into that. When I say that Murray is doing this interreligious learning, I want to really tag how, and I'm looking at Professor Dixie, how folks like uh, Benjamin Mays, Howard Thurman, Polly Murray, James Farmer, the other folks who were living at the Harlem Ashram, they were doing, they were recognizing and doing careful interreligious work. So I'm trying to, gonna try and like not to bring you down a rabbit hole with me, but let me just say this. No, do it, do it, do it. Okay, here, here, here's my little rabbit hole. Here. The, the history of religious studies can be told in a lot of different ways. In part, it's profoundly a colonial project. That when you have something like history of religions and you have something like world religions classes, until very recently, they were taught on an evolutionary spectrum. And you all just know this, and or maybe you don't, but it's trust, it's, I, I assert it's the case. Um, and one of the things that happens historically going back to kind of the, the beginning of the discipline of religious studies is that Eastern religions, particularly Indian religions are seen as a, what, a, what a sixth scholar has called static and frozen objects. So they are objects to be studied, not traditions to be engaged with, of living traditions and to learn from folks. Well, what you have in the 1930s, again, I'm pointing to Professor Dixon who's written about Thurman in this way and Thurman going Thurman and Sue Bailey Thurman and two others going to South Asia. Benjamin Mays goes six months later. Benjamin Mays is writing, um, who, who was at the time Dean of the Howard School of Religion. He goes on to be president of Morehouse, known as one of um, King's most important mentors, but was himself a foundational figure in black religion and black theology, kind of a proto black theologian in many ways. When he goes to India, he's writing these articles for the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a local paper but with a national readership, where he's talking about the Indian independence movement and he's talking about the differences between Gandhi and Nehru. And he's talking about Gandhi's religiosity and the differences between how ahimsa or nonviolence emerges more out of Jainism than from Hinduism. So he's doing this in like 800 words. So he's doing this really, really careful work. It's like awesome. And it was in the newspaper. And yeah. But one of the things he's doing then is he's saying, this is what these, this is what's happening in India. I'm gonna tell you the different activists. I'm gonna show you that there's people who disagree. Nehru and Mays, dis uh, Nehru, pardon me, and Gandhi disagreed about a lot of things. There were different tactics and strategies to say that in an American movement, all of this is gonna be at play. But one of the things he did as both, he was a uh, ordained Baptist minister, head of the Howard School of Religion, Christian theologian, he was also doing this careful religious studies work. And so when I say interreligious, I mean, you had these black Christians and black Christian intellectuals who were taking Indian religion seriously, who were engaging with them as living religions, who were saying to activists, tell me about 
what you're doing and why. Not merely like taking what was happening in India, trying to translate it. They're saying, we want to learn about what's happening in your context and see whether or not. And so when I, when I refer to Murray as interreligious, interreligious that, work is, that word is doing a lot of work. But it's that she's living in the Harlem Ashram and she's studying this and trying to figure it out. Period. New paragraph. <laughs> For those of you who know about particularly the history of Black religion in this country, so there's um, a great book by Curtis Evans, The Burden of Black Religion, that he talks about the history of Black religion. And it's fascinating how the ways in which Black religiosity was talked about in the 1920s and 30s is very similar to how religious studies at the time was talking about, especially Indian and Eastern religion as a-emotional and a-historical. So this sense in which these Black religious studies scholars, I think, really understood that the way in which Black religion was mischaracterized was similar to the way that these Indian religious figures were being mischaracterized. And so I think it's not a coincidence then that they were willing and able to be doing this really careful, critical, interreligious work. The gender question is such a good question. I don't even know. Work. I love you. Yeah, write, write the paper. Yeah, I'm doing this because that relationship comes a little bit later. So she um, went to school here in Durham at high school. Her, her aunt, actually, the woman, her namesake, Aunt Pauline, was a school teacher. Um, she goes to New York, and she actually wants to enter college in New York, but by all accounts isn't ready, so does an extra year of high school, then goes to Hunter College, which was an integrated part of the CUNY system, City University of New York. Um, and then later is at law school at Howard. Um, which by all accounts was not a great experience for a few different reasons. Um, and then later comes back to Yale. In, get the date wrong. He's a vice president of Benedict College, which is in South Carolina, which is an HBCU that's an all women's college. Didn't go so well. She just wasn't cut out for admin, I think, or. So, I mean, her, her experience of, so, but to address your question, specifically of her experience of HBCUs, especially in the 40s and 50s, I would say is really centered around Howard and what was going on. She was at the law school at the time. She was not the only woman in her entering class, but she was the only one to graduate. Um, but while she was at Howard, I mean, I, I write about this somewhere else, it's really hard to overestimate how Howard was the most extraordinary university in the United States. That there were all these leading figures in philosophy and religious studies, absolutely, um, in economics, in political science. And so I think Mur or Murray's at this hotbed and really recognizes, um, uh, really recognizes Howard as the intellectual black capital, but the intellectual capital of what's happening on the East Coast. Yeah, I mean, right. And I think that partly that really, um, she had seen and encountered, especially uh, attorneys who were NAA attorneys, but who were all either had been trained or were teaching at Howard. And I think when she got to Howard, really recognized the ferment of what was possible at an HBCU that she hadn't, for example, experienced at Hunter, which by all accounts was integrated, but not really. There weren't very many Black students. And so when she's at Howard, not only at the law school is she being trained by the people who would, for example, be the lawyers to argue Brown. Like, um, yes, they're good Marshall, but also Spotswood Robinson, Leon Hasty and, uh, or, um, Hasty and Leon Ransom. 
But when she was there, she was organ when she was at Howard in 1943 19, pardon me, 43 and 1944, that spring, she organized sit-ins of um, DC area lunch counters. And Howard University, which at the time received most of its funding, although it was an HBCU, it received most of its funding from the federal government. The president, Mordecai Johnson at the time, was really nervous about Murray. And it was mostly women who were leading these protests, which is an interesting fact in the history of nonviolent protest, in part because many men were serving abroad in the war. And Murray went to Howard Thurman, who taught at Howard at the time, and to ask him for advice because he knew about his work and his writing. And he said, mm -hmm. uh, which was disappointing, um, but also had, he had practical and pragmatic reasons for saying so. So that's to say, I think Howard really was for experience of what, what is life giving about an HBCU? Yes, and so like um, I would say, if you all don't know um, Rosenberg's biography of Murray, we'll talk about that. I would say in the greater sense. Yeah, I forget what it's. Called. Hi. Um. So my question. Um. You mentioned that. Um, during Polly Murray's time, um, that sexuality and uh, like trans and non-binary and pronouns were not super relevant at the time. Um, today, where um, pronouns and those gen and those um, sexuality terms are becoming more relevant, what do you think um, Polly Murray would say about where we are with diversity today? Would you say we're going in the right direction, the wrong direction, or have we, or are we still in the same place we are since her time? Great question. Um, are you asking a 30-year-old Polly Murray or a 60-year-old Polly Murray? And, that, and you don't have to answer. I mean that sort of rhetorically. Because as you'll see in the documentary, one of the things that I'm going to, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to answer your question. I'm not going to draw an analogy. I'm going to say something and I'm going to answer your question. One of the things that you'll see if you watch the documentary is that um, students at Brandeis Black students, of, and, and so Patricia Hill Collins was a student of Polly Murray, was in Polly Murray's class, um, for those of you who know. Um, yeah, um, but Hill, who at the time was Patricia Hill, but Hill and other uh, Black students were really frustrated that Polly Murray wouldn't say Black. Say Afro-American, she insisted on the term Negro for specific reasons that she gave, but the capital N, but that it felt and sounded stilted to the students who were, what, like, what do you mean? Um, and, it, and it dated her and it seemed to them, I think, a, a, a stubborn, it was, it was strangely stubborn. So I, so I use that to say that I think on the one hand, Murray, where we are, Today, I say this in my institution where it goes without saying that you introduce yourself with your pronouns, that that's part of, I have students, I have two students who refuse not to use pronouns. Um, so I would say that on the one hand, a younger Polly Murray would be there. Um, I think an older Polly Murray probably would as well, but it's just to recognize that when we, when we talk about someone historically to think about the different moments in their life, I think that Murray would be so relieved and excited for generations of people who will be able to live truly and diversely within their own gender identity and performance. And like it changed for her, arguably, over their life, I think it's wonderful. I think she would think it's wonderful that that's possible. That is. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so just this is kind of nerdy question for things I, I mentioned. So there's an extraordinary moment in New York at that time. You, you've got Ella Baker, you've got Bayard Rustin, and, and a whole host of others working with Paulie Murray. They kind of go in different directions eventually, Paulie Murray being very involved in forms of and pioneering forms of direct action and, and forms of organizing, and then makes us turn to the law Ella Baker kind of stays with popular education, pioneers a whole raft of what become very key organizing and kind of alternative leadership models. And Bayard Rustin develops this more kind of national strategy approach and then obviously culminating in the March on Washington. Can you just talk a little bit about those different trajectories and, and why Murray makes us turn to the law? And do you think she kind of, what, what was, why why that why that move um i mean i have kind of own reflections that but i'd just be interested to see you, your own thoughts on that yeah thank you um i think for a couple different reasons i i don't mean this so sort of like patly or in a silly way i think she loved the school and was good at and believed in education in a way not that Murray and Rustin didn't, but Rustin never finished university. He never finished college. And I think Rustin's capacity, like in, in the 40s, you know, even before he's in prison for almost two years, not for conscientious objection, but for not abiding by conscription, that he travels and is doing these um, like all over the country and does, by all accounts, a thousand trainings in, in nonviolence. In their um, and that Baker, again, is her belief in the capacity of communities to know. So she situates knowledge there. I think Rustin, I'm gonna do a little sneaky theological move. I'm gonna say he's a good Quaker in the sense that he situates knowledge and practice. So he's literally bringing his body and traveling and teaching other people how to do it and learning himself and practicing how to do it. I think Murray really did believe in school. I think she loved school. I think she was always good at school. And I think she believed in the transformative capacity of this intellectual work. Like what I should know, I'm the, it's my job to know this, not you all, but there's this uh, quotation that's, um, that is asserted that she said, a, a woman plus a movement is a, a woman plus a typewriter is a movement. I think that that was her. She, she had the capacity to do the other work, she lived at the Y, that's how she met Ella Baker. They were living at the Y, right? Um, but I think one of the things, and thank you so much for this question, such a great, you, such a great pedagogical question. It teaches us the different kind of options is that we really see in that, one of the things that um, Patricia Hill Collins, when she talks about Sojourner Truths, you know, invokes Malcolm by any means necessary, that we need all of these different approaches. We need all of these different skill sets we need all of these different ways of attacking and undermining and asserting what freedom looks like, living into it. And I think that, and so why does she do that? My sense is that was, those were her skills, but also what she loved. 